Hey man, it is the Ace Michael Show, and I'm Ace Michaels, your host for The Affair. Happy to be with you today and every day. Listen man, today we have a special guest on the show, but before I get to that, I want to tell you, if you want to be on the show, all you have to do is call us. You can call 702-540-3498. Again, it's 702-540-3498. That will get you on the show. Or you can email, if you want to email, Buzz at yahoo.com that will give you the opportunity to voice your opinion speak your mind your suggestions convictions beliefs ideas uh, dreams aspirations inspirations all that you can do it right here on the show today my guest is gabrielle burton gabrielle welcome to the show thank you for having me it is my pleasure now i want to talk a little bit i'm going to just go straight into it with no small talk because you've got a big long title after your name. Oh. So, so that's, I mean, anytime I see somebody who's like, you know, da 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 da, da then I want to know exactly what is all of that da 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 da. So right. you are a. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist intern. Wow. So you're a licensed marriage and family therapist intern. Yes. So you're dealing with a lot of people who are divorcing or coming from maybe abuse relationships domestic violence issues yeah right? yep I deal with a variety of issues so um, I see couples families and also individuals as well um, anywhere from dealing with anxiety depression grief loss mm. um, premarital counseling um, divorce counseling um, even um, people that are maybe trying to figure out how to co-parent so it's just oh, kind wow. of, yeah, a variety of issues that people might be dealing with, and they come to a therapist to kind of help them sort it out and just hopefully open up lines of communication. Now, when I know that you do something like that, my first thought is you clearly don't have a relationship going on your own. Because like, like, <laughs> after work, you know what I'm saying? Like if you work at McDonald's, dog, you don't want to see two beef patties ever in life. You're like, dog, if I see another special sauce, yeah. I'm out of here. So you, you probably kind of keep it single, right? Well, I mean, one day I would love to get married, um, but currently I am single. Because it's hard, right? Because you're seeing a lot of dysfunctional stuff. Well, I mean, yes and no. I, I kind of just chalk it up to I haven't really met the right person, but I definitely think that um, being a therapist, I'm a lot more cautious mm -hmm. as to the relationships I do um, engage in just because I'm able to detect like dysfunction like <laughs> that. Red flag, red <laughs> yeah, flag. Yeah, pretty much. I'm red like, flag. wait, Hope what's that? Red flags. <laughs> pretty much. Like, like someone, if they don't know why they were recently divorced, it's like, you don't know why you were oh, divorced and you're trying to date me. That concerns me. Like, if right. you don't know what your part in it was, then I don't know. And I really, I don't want to find out. <laughs> so now, I got a thing. I, you know, that's interesting. You said, I got a thing that bothers me. Okay. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to talk to a therapist about that. Yep. So luckily okay. for me. I spent hundreds of thousand of dollars to finally get to talk to one. Sure. So I'll, send you, I'll send you an invoice afterwards. <laughs> People who get married. Okay. Okay. This is my thing. Okay. You get married one time. Mm -hmm. Sure. It didn't work out. Okay. You get married again. Mm -hmm. Sure. But something happened. Lightning struck that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. You get married a third time. What I don't understand is these people that are on their fourth and fifth and even sixth marriages. Mm -hmm. What's up with that, Doc? Well, I think everybody has their own, you know, everybody's reasonings can be different. Um, but it could be one of many things. It could be a love addiction where they're just addicted. They got to, an addiction to love? It could be that. Oh, I mean, of course they I'm, do. I'm not right. saying, I'm not saying I'm not everybody. Well right. I, I'm not saying everybody, but um, it could be that they really love like the the feelings that they get in the beginning of the relationship and they love like this cycle of like a love addiction. Hmm. Um, but a lot of times it's kind of like the idea of um, insanity where you do the same thing and expect a different result. Hmm. They are thinking that, okay, well, I wasn't the problem, so I'm going to go into this next relationship and this is going to fix it. Um, there is something where it's called um, 
your belief system does not actually line up to your life condition. I would love to write it out for you because it's actually like a formula. Huh. Um, <laughs> but a lot of times people, like, so let's say your belief system says life should be easy, marriage should be great, and like my spouse should make me happy. And then your life condition is my spouse isn't making me happy, marriage isn't easy, and you know, like this is this is not fun for me. Hmm. So what they do is they actually change their life condition. They go and they get a new partner. Mm -hmm. Because my belief system is that marriage should be easy and that my partner should make me happy, right? Mm -hmm. So they change their life condition and they go find another partner. And then but their belief system is still the same. And so then this this person is not fitting their belief system, so they find another partner. Mm. The problem is they have not changed their belief system. Their okay. belief system is messed up. So does that make any sense? Uh, it made complete sense to me. <laughs> so a lot of times, that's what therapy can help you do, is it can help you f like find out what are those dysfunctional patterns that people are repeatedly, repeatedly doing, mm -hmm. and how can we break those cycles so that you can create a new healthy cycle. Now, what about this? I'm just going to throw a bunch at you because I, these are ones that are on my mind. I don't have a bunch of them on my mind, but there are some that are really hard for me to figure out. Okay, okay. so for example, here's two. I'm just going to do two more. Okay. Can I do two more and then we're done with Sure, it? yeah. Okay, so here's the other one. The other one I don't understand is the person, male or female, who's in love and probably married to the person who's serving a life sentence in prison. Hmm. What, how how in the world can that be fulfilling? So that one is different because everybody has a different story. So I would need to know, like, well, what what is it that that person is fulfilling for you? What what was your relationship hmm. like before they went to jail? Um, that kind of thing. So I honestly can't even give you an idea as to why that would be because everybody would have a different reason for what that is. But to be with a person you that you can't even be with, like you, I mean, how would you ever? You can't even touch that person. You can't hold their hand, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's crucial for a relationship. You gotta well, be able for, to touch Well, for right? some people, and then for some people, it might just be that I have that moral support. I have someone that's thinking about me that I can write a letter to. Um, maybe the distance is nice, so that I don't have to be. So mm -hmm. you know, I could. I can't really give you an exact answer as to why. Yeah, but everybody has a different um, expectation of what a relationship should look like. That is true. Okay, and that was takes me right to my third one that mm -hmm. really boggled my mind. Since mm -hmm. I moved to Las Vegas, this one became more prevalent than any place else I'd ever been. It is the individual who does not engage in adult-related work, be it porn or escorting or whatever, but is happily involved with the person who is extremely involved in porn, escorting, or whatever. So they're married or they're in this long-term relationship where one of them is completely, what's the medical term for it? Yeah. Buck wild. <laughs> and the other one is like this pillar of salt that's like, oh, when you get done with yeah. the football team, then just I'll pick you up at seven. Right. What's right. up with that? So again, like all couples have different expectations of what works in a relationship yeah. and I'm not one to judge you know I mean I Me know hey. and I know and I know like what you know I would like or not like in a relationship but like for some people like that works for them right. um it can it keeps things interesting it could be like <laughs> at least my spouse is wanted and desired but they right. come home to me at night I mean you know it could be it could be something like that actually when I was in grad school we had to take different topics that were like hot topics and we had to study them and then we would put um, we were there'd be two different teams where we would have to debate for or against the specific topic so hmm. we actually looked at swinging for instance sure and so like half of us would be for swinging and half of half of us would be against swinging and we had to find research that supported why people would you know choose one way or the other hmm. and so it was interesting because um, whether whatever side you stand on they would be bringing research that would kind of support both sides and there's actually couples that like swinging enhances their relationship and mm -hmm. I mean from some research that was shown so it kind of helped me as a therapist kind of say okay let me go in with an open mind and really just try to understand like what are the strengths of the couples relationship mm -hmm. you know um, so uh, it just kind of just depends on what the couple really wants in their relationship you know, as I've gotten older, and, and contrary to popular belief, I am getting older, um, <laughs> I I think I can understand a little bit more about, like, for example, swinging. Like, you know, 
Um, we've been getting our freak on for six, seven years now. I'm tired of getting my freak on with you. It's not even really a freak anymore. It's getting kind of normal. So why don't you go on Tuesdays and go get your freak on, and I'm going to watch uh, Game of Thrones, and when you come back, you know, everybody's happy. Now I can kind of see that. Um, I want to, before we run out of time, I want to go to another thing that you do. It's a completely separate thing now. Yes. Okay, so now you organize events for your therapy, which, by the way, I noticed... You never said anything about mentally ill people in any of these scenarios. So yeah. is it that you don't believe that this individual that's doing this stuff, ment mental illness has nothing to do. That's a separate thing, right? Well, so each person is different. So it could be that, you know, that mental illness could be playing a factor into some of these behaviors. Oh, but I wouldn't necessarily say that every person that is engaging that lifestyle has a mental illness. I like that like mental illness playing a factor. That's how I'm going to get out of the next ticket I get. <laughs> like, I'm really sorry. Listen, man, mental illness is playing a factor right, right? here. Bro. I don't know what to tell you. I'm, I'm mentally ill for this particular moment. What? Mental illness is playing a factor. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Every probably four weeks, maybe once a month-ish, mm -hmm. somebody will come on the show that will say what I call should be the t-shirt slogan. Okay. That right there. <laughs> mental illness is playing a factor. I love it. Oh, I love it. Like mental illness is this little red de devil over here right. on your shoulder. Yeah. And then you got this other green devil on your shoulder. And the mental illness is like, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like as a therapist, we actually see things like systemically. So I don't necessarily just look at only mental illness. Like let's say I have yeah. a client that comes into my office and they're like, Depression, oh, that's the issue, and they it's just depression. Well, I will look at, okay, so we say it's depression, but how does depression play into your family? How does it play into society? Okay. How does it play into your socioeconomic status? And, hmm. um, you know, there's a lot of different factors that are actually contributing to why a person is the way they are. A lot of times people think it's just one issue, but it's not. There's so many other factors that play into it. So that's why I say mental illness can be one of the factors mm -hmm. that could be having someone act out in a certain way, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. There could be that people choose to, you know. I'm surprised I'm even intelligent enough to keep up with what you're saying, Gabrielle. That's what, <laughs> the main thing that's freaking me out is I'm like, every word she's saying, I kind of get it. Wow, check me out. Awesome. Um, so you put this uh, event together. You put this camp together for these kids. Tell us yeah. about that. Yeah, so the camp was called Illuminate, a performing arts camp. Nice. And I had it. It was June 19th to the 23rd. And so I was kind of telling you earlier, but yeah. um, it was just an idea that I had. Um, it was the summertime. And um, I was like, okay, like I need to figure out something to do. I love working with kids and I love the performing arts. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out a way to marry my two passions of therapy and the performing arts. And so I just had this idea. <laughs> right. Seriously. Because like, they so go together. They do. I mean, the performing <laughs> arts are very therapeutic. And I'll tell you, a lot of my clients, I, I actually, I would say I specialize in like teens and young adults. And I use like the creative arts and the performing arts as a way of helping them. Nice. Um, to their healing so I've had clients where I'm like hey just like write a script and we'll perform it or like like write a write your story or um, you know write a song about this or, hmm. or paint or journal and it's amazing because a lot of times creatives because they feel so deeply they struggle a lot with like anxiety and depression and so they need to find an outlet and so that's where I come in because I'm like I get it I'm a creative and I love therapy so let's do this right. so so um, illuminate was just an idea that I had and I pitched it to um, it's Lake Mead Christian Academy they're an amazing um, school they do K through 12th grade private school and so I told them I was like hey I have this idea I really want to do this performing arts camp for middle and high school kids um, and the whole point of it was to teach kids that while they are creative and they're and they have creative gifts that their gifts are meant to illuminate the world and so we are supposed to use our, our creative gifts to either raise an awareness of an issue or to create solutions to problems around us hmm. and so that's that's what the premise of the camp was and so I told them you know about my idea and they're like that's awesome what's your budget and I was like I don't have any money. <laughs> like, Zero dollars. I have nothing. But it's, right. a, it's this idea that it's I have. Yeah. Idea. I was like, well, I really yeah, want to, exactly. you know. And they're just like, all right, we've never done anything to this capacity before, but uh, we're going to let you go with it. And I was like, okay, cool. So I go through and I start like designing the logo and I, I you know, order t-shirts and all this kind of stuff. 
and I'm sitting there and at first I had like four kids sign up and I was just like oh lord like I really need more people to come in plus I had people like staff that I already had picked and said you're gonna teach photography you're gonna teach videography you're gonna teach oh, wow. dance and theater so I already had people lined up and I told them I was gonna pay them a certain rate mm. a certain stipend but I didn't have the money and so um, I just kind of had to walk by faith to be completely honest and so as like the weeks kept going on, I went from like four to like 10 and 10 to like 20 and 20 to like 25. And then at the end, I ended up having 32 kids signed up. Oh wow! And it was just amazing. And I had the parents, they were just like, this was done so well. And they were like, I can't believe this was your first camp. And I couldn't believe it either. Like I couldn't believe how easy everything came to me. Every day after um, the camp, I would send the parents a letter of, today our topic was on character. And we talked about how it's important to have great character character even though you're talented that your character needs to be you know refined and tuned and that's gonna help you in any area of, of life whether it's in the performing arts or any job and then we talked about um, we talked about uh, influence and leadership and we also talked about the transcendentals which means that your art should always point to what is good what is beautiful and what is true mm. a lot of times in our culture we love art because it points to something that's beautiful but it may not be pointing to what is good or true so mm. when we're looking at something that's beautiful it actually becomes an idol but it's not pointing to anything that's good or true. Mm -hmm. So it's really like teaching, it was teaching the kids about having a Christian worldview mm -hmm. because whatever um, is in our heart, that's what's actually gonna come out through our art. Anytime we're consuming art, we're, we are experiencing the artist worldview. Mm -hmm. So I was really trying to challenge the kids to like, you know, go through and just check like, well, what is it that you believe and what's your worldview to make sure that before you present something to people to make sure that your heart is right. Now, does that go to say that a filmmaker like Quentin Tarantino that makes a lot of violent films mm. is not creating true art in your opinion and that I mean clearly some people think what he does is beautiful mm. although it may not be the other two things yeah so honestly like for what I was sharing with them it was more like a Christian worldview so <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> very much Christian like, these worldview. kids are like nine so yeah, well, we're not talking about that the, deep, <laughs> I mean well what we did though we would actually take like lyrics from like artists like okay. certain singers and then we would like dissect the lyrics and we would just be like okay so he's talking about you know bees and hoes and he's talking about you right. know if I can't have you I'll get another one like is that true is that good is that right. beautiful you know right. and like kind of just being mindful of the art that we're consuming because when that's we, good that you, you know, did that because it's like if you're listening to these things and you're kind of going along with these ideals it's like really is that what you want to do you believe? think that you personally do you think that the more we listen to misogynistic lyrics that we will start thinking that way i think so i definitely think you become yeah, desensitized so desensitized to it you know like the more you see violence the more you see i think things. we actually will start doing it i think the more you hear that saying money comes before everything yeah then you start thinking yeah yeah, money does come before everything. Right. Even if I don't have any. Yeah. Well, that's what I need to do to go get some. I need to do something drastic to go yeah. get some because, right, money comes before everything. Right. If you hear it enough, I do think you will. Right. So that that's interesting. So are you going to keep the camp going every summer? I definitely want Can to. Can I go? I would go. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I would love to keep doing oh, it again. And I was asked by another um, school to put it on again, too. So. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's a good that's thing. a lot of fun. And then in addition to running a camp like a boss, uh, <laughs> as if that wasn't enough, you are author of a new book, and the book is called, let me make sure I got it right, It's is it called Ultimate Guide to Being a Gold Digger? Oh, the Ultimate Guide the to ultimate Becoming. Guide to be to becoming a, yes, gold, a gold digger. digger. Yeah, not just being yes, one. Because yeah. after you be one, that's the sequel book. Right. This right. is how you get to be a <laughs> exactly. gold digger. Exactly. Okay, so the book is called The Ultimate Guide to Becoming. Yep. A gold digger. Mm -hmm. How does one become a gold digger? Tell me yeah. a little bit about this book. Okay, so um, I know it sounds like most of the time when people hear the word gold digger. It sounds think, salacious. It does. It, it does. does. And you know what? I did that on purpose. I, apparently <laughs> so. We live in Las Vegas. Salacious. Come yes. on. Like, you know, people are obsessed with wealth and with fame and all that kind of stuff. Um, but truly, the, the book talks about how I actually call myself a gold digger as a therapist because I believe everyone has wealth and value and talents and abilities within them. And so I want to be able to be the one to bring out those the things that are going to enhance the, the value of their relationships and themselves. Okay. So the book talks okay. about how we have to be willing to dig out the gold and the value within ourselves that will ultimately enhance our lives and our relationships. And so, true. 
Yeah. I say true. I'm with that. Please. Yeah. Please do continue. <laughs> um, very good. Thanks. Thank you. So um, kind of just like the start of how the book, um, where it starts out, is it talks about how in 1849 there was the gold rush. And people came from all over the world looking for this gold. And it was the first time that it actually created a multi-ethnic, multi-cultural, and multi-religious society. Hmm. And gold represented hope. It represented um, like it represented like a new beginning and yeah. opportunity. And so people were excited. A lot of men actually left their wives at home because they were like, "Babe, you stay here. You stay here with the kids. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna get I'm gonna get my money and I'm gonna make a living. I see and then you know, going. and I'm gonna come back and we're gonna live we're gonna live large. You know, and right. you're not gonna have we're not, I'm not gonna have to work every day. So that's what these people were sold on. So they jumped on on ships and they sailed across the river to come to mm. what we now know as San Francisco right. but they went and they were looking for this gold they were looking for gold and it was called the Sierra Nevada River and so what men would have to do is they would they would put their hands in this river and when you look down in the river it was just like black dirt just black dirt so you would pick up a handful of black dirt and you'd throw it in a pan and mm -hmm. you would sift through the pan mm -hmm. and and I mean again you pretty much had to believe that there was gold to be found that's the whole thing you had to pretty much believe that there was gold so they would shake through it and they would pan through it and all of the black dirt would go back into the water but the gold would actually sink to the bottom of the pan sure. and so that's the idea of gold digging the pan handlers yes right. yes yeah. and so um um, and so pretty much gold digging means that you have to be willing to take a risk okay. and you have to really believe that there's there's something to be found now during the gold rush not everybody struck it rich there was actually a lot of violence and a lot of like tension because of of intolerance and greed and all that kind of stuff so there was a lot of wars and famine during the earth a lot of wars and things like that during that time. Um, however, there was a man by the name of James Allen, and he is what I actually would say that he's a gold digger. So what he did was mm. he had no desire to go out there and like dig for gold, truly. He was like, that is not for me. <laughs> so what he decided to do was he actually opened up a, a general store right in front of the Sierra Nevada River, and he did what was called Mind the Miners. He opened up a general store and he provided them with the tools that they needed to be successful to look for the gold. Uh -huh. He ended up striking it rich because he made hundreds of thousand of dollars a day, like just giving them what they needed. Now, the reason why I call him a gold digger is because he looked within himself. He saw the gifts, the talents, the abilities that he had, and then he saw a need and he fulfilled it. Right. The same thing was true with women. During that time, there was 90% um, men and 10% women. Uh -huh. And so at the time, this was when women, um, this was the first time where women were actually able to be paid for their domestic skills and things like that. Men were willing to pay like so much money for like a home cooked meal or for like their laundry to be cleaned and all that kind of stuff. So these women opened up bed and breakfasts, inns, and um, laundry mats. And wow. so they were also gold diggers because they looked within the, themselves, they saw the talents, the gifts, the abilities they had, and they saw a need and they fulfilled it. So that's the whole point of the book. Becoming a gold digger is not really going out and looking for like the wealth out here, but looking for the wealth within yourself. Nice. And how can you build build your life that way? Me likey. Um, <laughs> wow. But my brain is, you know, when you get scrambled <laughs> eggs, that's kind of where my head's at right now. Um, Gabrielle, if people want to contact you, they want to get the book or they mm -hmm. want to get some therapy with you, they yeah. want to be in touch, how do they reach you on the uh, www? On the World Wide Web. Yes. <laughs> well, so the book is not out just yet. Um, it still needs to be edited, so all of that content is still being worked out. And I see clients at the Lake Mead Wellness Center. That's in Henderson, Nevada. Um, and then you can also find me on Facebook, Gabrielle Burton Therapy, um, and go ahead and like me that, uh, like my page, and yeah. And that is what's that up. Yeah. Hey man, some good thoughts today. I like it very much. Hey, check out Gabrielle's page and support what she's doing. I always say if you find somebody that's doing something that's good and positive, it's a no-brainer. You need to be supporting that. So make sure you check out what she's doing. And that's the end of the show for today. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing and liking and making us number one on your social media dial. If you ever want to be on the show, we gave you that information. And you know what I say at the end of every show, and I still mean it. Live the life you love. Love the life you live. Thank you.